In 2007, the so-called Phantom of Heilbronn shot to prominence following the brutal slaying of police officer Michelle Kiesvetter in Heilbronn, Germany. However, this was far from the suspected killer's only crime. The same DNA was found at 40 crime scenes in Germany and beyond. Also dubbed the woman without a face, all police knew about the Phantom was the DNA indicated she was female and of Eastern European descent. The case was as fascinating as it was perplexing. The Phantom was linked to six murders, and female serial killers are extremely rare, only representing about 11% of serial murderers in the last century. The Phantom was also suspected of a string of burglaries in Germany, France, and Austria. Police searched for her from 1993 until 2009, when German authorities finally uncovered the chilling truth. I got a treat for you all today. Today I'm collaborating with Mike from Mystery Files. And since you all like true crime, mysterious and strange storytelling, then I'm sure you'll love Mike as well. So stick around after this story because I'll be handing the mic over to Mike and he'll be telling one of his great stories. So make sure to check out his YouTube channel after you watch this video and show him some love. Hello strangers and strangelings, welcome back to the Strange Bar and Grill. I'm serving up another true crime story time. Right now, I'm just drinking some whiskey, and again, not saying the brand name because I'm not getting paid to promote, so it's just generic whiskey to you. And plus, it puts me right where I need to be. So make sure to pull up a chair. If you like strange true crime and storytelling, then this is the place to be here with me, JP. So kick back and grab a drink or a snack, and remember to always tip that like button because it helps with the channel. Join that SBG family by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to make sure you're getting notified when I release a weekly video. And remember, I've been drinking, but I ain't been driving. All right, let's go. The Phantom of Heilbronn. The Phantom first struck in May 1993 in Adar Oberstein, Germany. A 62-year-old woman named Lizalette Schlanger had been found dead in her home, strangled with a length of wire taken from a bunch of flowers in her living room. The day before her murder, Schlanger emptied nearly all of her cash from her savings account. Now, this is something very unusual for the normally very frugal widow. Police found none of the money in her home. Now, at this time, DNA testing was pretty much in its infancy, but the investigators swabbed the rim of a teacup found close to the body, just in case. The sample wasn't actually analyzed until 2001, but when it was, the result was shocking. It matched DNA found at dozens of other crime scenes. On March 26th, 2001, the Phantom's DNA was found again at the scene of a murder. This time, of a 61-year-old man in Freiburg, Germany, Joseph Walsenbach. Joseph was an antiques dealer from the town of Freiburg, about three hours away from the first crime scene eight years earlier at Adar Oberstein. He had been savagely beaten with an undetermined blunt object and strangled with a belt. Now, like the Schlanger case, cash had been taken from the Walsenbach crime scene. Now, the same unknown female DNA found at the Schlanger scene was also found in a drawer at the Walsenbach scene. These clues gave the investigators the idea of a murderous female robber. That is, until they realized this crime spree was far from over. On October 24th, 2001, a child stepped on a syringe containing heroin near a playground in the city of Gerolstein, Germany, a little over four hours north of Freiburg. Heroin was a huge problem in this area of Germany at the time, so the police just cataloged the syringe and did little else with it, thinking it was just another random faceless junkie. This upset local parents to the point that they demanded a DNA test on the syringe, and the same test ended up finding the same DNA from the phantom on the syringe that was found at the Schlanger and Walsenbach crime scenes. Something's definitely going on here, this lady's killing people and leaving dirty syringes on playgrounds, like what is happening here? Police started building their profile from this point a female double murderer who engages in criminality to fund her habit? Sounds simple, right? Logical? Predictable? Not so much. There is zero consistency to the Phantom's behavior so far, which makes it tough. A profile may be useful if it updates with new information, like anything else. Still, the story just gets weirder and weirder in every way. This Phantom's DNA started appearing at an ever-widening range of crime scenes. 
Traces of the phantom were found at the site of a robbery in France and a recently burgled optometrist's shop in Austria. She was linked to the theft of more than 20 cars and motorbikes and several home invasions. She even took a bite out of a cookie during a breaking and entering in Budenheim, Germany, which is about an hour and 10 minutes from the 1993 Schlanger crime scene. Could you imagine being so cocky that police would never catch you that you would literally leave crumbs at the crime scene like all this criming has me feeling a little peckish. Ooh, cookies. Like some sort of chameleon, the Phantom of Heilbronn seemed to shed her skin, face, and very shape as police gave chase. She thus earned the nickname, the woman without a face. Arbois, France, about five and a half hours south of Gerolstein, was rocked to its core when a group of Vietnamese precious gemstone traders were brutally attacked by a gang of robbers. The robbers made off with about 3,000 euros, jewelry and gold bullion. But the most interesting find at the scene was a reproduction of a Beretta FS92 pistol. Once ran through the French and German databases, the DNA of our unknown female master criminal was found on it. All four Four male robbers were arrested soon after the heist. None of them copped to the involvement of a female accomplice, even while under intense and protracted interrogation by French and German authorities. Whoever this faceless woman is, she must be pretty hardcore if her accomplices refuse to rat on her, because most people put in that situation, they're snitching. Like they start showing some before and after photos, like, hey, look, there's a hardened criminal here. This is a uh, uh, T-Rock before prison. You know, he's showing a picture, he's all hard and just tough dude, gangster. And they show an after photo, and it's him in a halter top. That usually does it, that usually makes someone crack. And I'm sure they did that, because that's an actual police tech. I don't know if that's a police tech. <laughs> I don't know what's going <laughs> But they couldn't make them crack, is my point. So if you're keeping track, so far that's three countries that are murderous, mystery, junkie, cookie-loving, criminal mastermind has terrorized. She also, apparently, scared several hardened street thugs into absolute silence about her existence. And she's far from done. Now, if this was the movies, they would probably cut to a scene of some sexy woman walking in high heels, red lipstick, you know, dark sunglasses, mysterious, but this is real life, 100%, this lady's a baked potato. Don't get tangled and twisted though. Like I'll devour a baked potato with you know some butter, some chives, some sour cream and bacon. I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about right now. Sorry, this whiskey's catching up to me and I can't run very fast guys, sorry. Now, once the police had a bead on the Phantom, they started testing DNA from old crimes. The results shocked them. From May 1993 to October 2008, the Phantom was linked to 30 separate crime scenes in Germany and Austria. Her DNA was found at office robberies, home burglaries, supermarket heists, and mini shed and campground thefts. The Austrian authorities were able to find out that the Phantom's mitochondrial DNA was most common amongst people from Eastern Europe and Russia. Then, a police officer was murdered. Officer Michelle Kiesvetter loved the town of Heilbronn. Even though she was from a major regional narcotics squad, she really enjoyed stopping by when she had some free time. On April 25th, 2007, in southwest Germany while eating their lunch, Officer Kiesvetter and her partner, Officer Martin Arnold, parked their patrol car in the shade of a tree, which was not far from the lot housing the Phantom of Heilbronn Task Force. Then a masked person squirmed into the rear of their BMW police cruiser and opened fire on both officers. Officer Kiesvetter was killed instantly from gunshot wounds to the head. She was only 22 years old. Officer Arnold spent three weeks in a coma after also being shot in the head. He survived, but with total amnesia. He didn't remember anything from the almost double homicide. He was 25 at the time. Both officers' sidearms were missing, as were their handcuffs. Forensic examination of the scene and the autopsy done on Officer Kiesvetter revealed two calibers from two different pistols. The Phantom's DNA was found in the BMW's center console and back seat. It took investigators three months to test the DNA. This fact is ultimately what thrust the entire series of crimes to the dead center of the public eye and compelled the government to throw massive amounts of cash at the problem. The chameleon monster of Heilbronn would swallow Officer Kiesvetter up, temporarily entangling the fallen hero in another bizarre criminal investigation, that of her own. And still, the crescendo of weird in this most bizarre case would not be reached for another two years.
It was a frigid day in January 2008 when police in Heppenheim, about one hour and 10 minutes northwest of Heilbronn, were called to fish three bodies out of a local body of water. The three men came from the Eastern European nation of Georgia, which is Joseph Stalin's birthplace, random fact, to buy used cars in Germany. Two of the men had gunshot wounds to the head and the third had been strangled. Two male suspects were soon arrested while driving a Ford Escort. Investigators found the Phantom's DNA inside it. Like the suspects in the Vietnamese precious gemstone trader robbery, despite intense interrogation, none of the suspects copped to the involvement of a female suspect in the triple homicide. Again, the Phantom's one bad woman and must have one hell of an underworld reputation. By now, the authorities in Germany, Austria, and France were going old school with their police work and launching a massive dragnet in each country to find the Phantom. Despite every cop in three countries looking for the Phantom, she managed to strike again on May 9th. One of the tiniest German states, the Saarland, was hit this time when a cleaning lady was brutally attacked and robbed at work. The Phantom got away with several hundred euros. On October 26th, in Heilbronn, Weisenberg, a 45-year-old nurse named Diana Pavlenko was found floating in a large pool of water. Her cause of death was clear to the investigators, but they understandably were not releasing it to have leverage over any suspect they do catch. There was no evidence of a suicide or sex offense having taken place. She had no visible wounds on her. She did have drugs in her system, but only at therapeutic levels. Her friends reported her history of suicidal thoughts and she was going through a divorce. Still, the only real forensic evidence was the Phantom's DNA found in the deceased woman's Kia Panda, parked not far from where her body was found. Soon after Pavlenko's murder, a gang of Albanian home invaders were arrested in Metz, France. The Phantom's DNA was found in one of their cars, yet again, none of the suspects would cop to a female accomplice in the interrogation because this lady is bad and nobody wants to cross her these new crimes attributed to the phantom prompted authorities to raise the reward for information to 150,000 euros by the year's end the phantom struck again this time it was in Saarbrücken, the capital of the Saarland region and this time the phantom left a witness to her treachery. Because the victim of the burglary in Saarbrücken said it was a male perpetrator and investigators found the Phantom's DNA at the scene, the police concocted the theory that the Phantom was a woman transitioning into a man. Others in law enforcement who were following the series of crimes came to an entirely different explanation. The man was merely another accomplice of the Phantom. If this were the case, the Phantom would have returned to the crime scene to leave her DNA or gave her mysterious male colleague something saturated with her DNA for him to plant it at the crime scene as a red herring for the police. In January 2009, the bounty on the Phantom's head was up to 300,000 euros. Just two months later, the police would find out just who was this ruthless criminal mastermind behind this 16-year long search. It was a highly intelligent woman who had zero intention of ever getting caught committing these types of crimes. But she also had no clue police would be closing in on her. In March of 2009, a man was arrested on a charge. He was given a DNA test on the spot. And guess what emerges? The Phantom's DNA. This guy was not transitioning to a woman and he had solid alibis for most of the crimes in this story. So what the hell happened here? In a word, you guessed it. But maybe you didn't guess it. Contamination. The DNA at some 30 crime scenes and six murders in three countries belonged to a woman of Eastern European heritage who worked at the South German firm who manufactures all the cotton swabs investigators in the tri-country area use for DNA collection. The innocent woman had handled the swabs during the manufacturing process, leaving her DNA on them. While the swabs were routinely sterilized before packing, the process wasn't enough to remove traces of genetic material, which is precisely why those swabs weren't certified for use in collecting or analyzing DNA samples. Someone in the purchasing department had accidentally ordered the wrong kind of swab, and it had come back to bite police in spectacular fashion, leading them on a 16-year-long goose chase looking for a killer who quite simply just didn't exist. And as German police spokesperson Joseph Schneider put it, this is a very embarrassing story. However, they didn't have time to hang their heads in shame because after all, 
They now had 40 unsolved cases to investigate. There never was a master criminal phantom of Heilbronn. Other police departments came to the same conclusion independently, but at the same time as their counterparts in other regions of Germany, France, and Austria. Investigators allegedly had an idea that it was contamination as early as one year before the March 2009 discovery because of inconsistencies in the timeline of the crimes. If that is indeed true, it begs the question, why did they not recheck the DNA against this possibility when they first suspected it? So around 40 cases, including six murders, had to restart from the ground up after the discovery of contamination. Throw in 1,400 false leads, 2,400 unneeded DNA checks, and you get about 16,000 wasted hours of overtime over eight years. So that's between 2001 and 2009. And to quantify the case monetarily, an estimated 2 million euros were wasted over the entire duration of the investigation. The money figure, of course, does absolutely nothing for the dozens of victims denied justice in their cases because of this colossal blunder by the police. And by the way, only Officer Kaisvetter's murder would actually be solved. And out of curiosity, I'm going to tell you how her murder was solved. From the year 2000 to 2007, the National Socialist Underground, or NSU, perpetrated a series of xenophobic murders, mostly targeting ethnic Turkish small business owners in Germany, but also one ethnic Greek and Officer Michelle Kiesvetter. Now, Officer Kiesvetter herself actually lived across from a bar that these neo-Nazis would frequent. And it's thought that the NSU got paranoid after some of them believed that she saw them in a meeting. Then two members from the NSU, Uwe Bonhart and Uwe Mundelos, made the choice to track Officer Kiesvetter down and shoot her. And ultimately, Mundelos killed Bonhart and then he would kill himself before they could actually be arrested for this crime. But all right, guys, that's going to be it for today. If you're new to my channel, make sure to join that SPG family and subscribe. And make sure to hit that like button. Leave a comment for me in the comment section. Let me know what you guys think of this story. It was kind of a weird one. But as always, I've been drinking, but I ain't been driving. So be safe. Be good. And make sure to stick around for Mr. E file story. After you watch this story, make sure to go check out his channel and subscribe to him as well. All right, I'm sending you over to Mr. E files. Let's go. Ah, thank you for that. Cheers, JP. But I'm actually gonna go with water this time. One second. All right. For those of you that do not know me, I am Mr. E files, and yes, that is a play on word for mystery files but today i have an absolute creepy extreme true crime story for you and also right now make sure to subscribe to strange bar and grill this collab is important and also if you want you can subscribe to me but basically we need to know if you guys like this the community the audience the people who gave us the job and guess what if you like it we'll do it again and again and again i mean me and strange you know jp we got a couple good things for you guys in store. So if I was you, I just would click that like button to let us know that you enjoyed. But without any further ado, as of now, it's time to slip into a mind that's not our own. Let's go. Okay, so what you are in store for is the case of Maria Martin. And it became one of England's most talked about crimes. And it's not just murder that was involved. There were also tales of secret relationships, supernatural abilities, vengeful mobs, and an ominous curse that lingered over everything in the end. Maria Martin came into this world in 1801, born to a family of meager means. Her father, Thomas, worked as a mole catcher in a small village of Polstead in Suffolk and relying on his skill at skinning moles and crafting their hides into gloves for their income. And sadly, after Maria's mother passed away, Thomas married a woman named Anne, a woman only slightly older than his daughter. So despite her humble beginnings, Maria was known for her stunning looks and her intelligence. And according to one story, a fortune teller predicted that she would have numerous admirers and wealth 
but would not live to see old age. And as it turned out, two of those three prophecies came true. And Maria's love life began in her early 20s when she entered into a romantic relationship with Thomas Corder, the son of a prosperous farm owner. However, when Maria became pregnant, Thomas deserted her. But in no time at all, Maria found a new partner to replace Corder, a man by the name of Peter Matthews. Sadly, too, Mariah's child with Corder passed away shortly after being born. But when Maria became pregnant once again, this time with Matthew's child, she learned that he also had no interest in taking on the responsibility of fatherhood or facing the inevitable gossip and judgment that came with having a child outside of marriage. But he promised to, you know, provide financial support, but wanted nothing to do with their raising of the child or being involved in any of their lives. And as soon as Maria delivered her baby, she was introduced to Thomas Corder's younger brother, William. Now, William was known for his thievery and involvement in petty crimes. William had been sent off to London by his father with a small sum of money in hopes that he would find employment and turn over a new leaf. But William wasted the money on indulgent pleasures and turned to a life of illegal activities. But when his father and brother suddenly fell ill, he was forced to return to the farm and help his mother manage it. And unfortunately, William's father succumbed to tuberculosis, and his brothers were left permanently disabled by the disease. Then Thomas, William's eldest brother, who had a child with Maria, tragically passed away after falling through ice into a freezing lake. I mean, it seems like death just follows this person or family around. And soon after, William's other brother also died prematurely, leaving William head of the household and in charge of their family farm. And it was during this time that he began an illicit relationship with Maria. So naturally, Maria's parents were not supportive of her relationship with William, given his questionable reputation and the fact that his brother had abandoned her while she was pregnant with their child. So as a result, William and Maria had to sneak around to see one another. And where they would sneak around to see each other was a well-known landmark in town called the Red Barn. And that became kind of their secret meeting spot. So after several encounters there, Maria discovered she was pregnant once again for the third time. But unlike his brother, William made a promise to marry Maria and take care of the family. And despite any doubts, Maria's circumstances demanded that she put her reservations aside. As a poor single mother in the early 19th century England, she had already brought great shame upon herself by having multiple children out of wedlock. And William, now from the inheritance of the farm, was a wealthy landowner and could potentially be her last chance at finding a husband who would not only marry her, but also provide for her and her family. So in an effort to avoid gossip and the scrutiny of the town, William sent Maria away to Sudbury to give birth to their child. But tragically, once again, the baby passed away just two weeks later and was buried in secret to protect both of their reputations from the scandalous label of illegitimacy. And there were rumors that William may have played a role in the child's death, as he was not planning on marrying Maria despite the relationship. And after the tragedy, their relationship became more turbulent and they just constantly argued. And Maria at that time suspected that William was actually taking Peter Matthews' child support money. And although William claimed that he still wanted to marry her, he never made any concrete plans. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, William had a change of heart and suggested that they elope in Ipswich. He even told her that there was a warrant out for her arrest because she had illegitimate children. And it's uncertain if this was actually true or just a ploy to pressure Maria into a rushed marriage. And some accounts mention Maria disguising herself as a man to avoid arrest and meet William on their planned elopement night. Was this, you know, the suggestion from William to ensure that no one could actually identify Maria? Okay, so the Red Barn was the last place Maria was seen alive. 
It was on that fateful day of May 18th 1827 when William lured her there with the promises of love and a future together. But as the sun set and the darkness crept in, Maria's fate was sealed. William had carefully crafted a web of lies to deceive her family and the town. He claimed an issue with the marriage certificate, but little did they know it was all part of his twisted plan. And while Maria's family at the time frantically searched for answers, William fled town and embarked on a journey to cover his tracks. So he traveled to London and then ventured to the Isle of Wight where he penned deceitful letters to Maria's family claiming that they were finally married and living happily on the island. But the truth remained buried deep within the walls of that red barn, haunting those who dared to wonder what truly happened to Maria on that dark night. So William fumbled through a series of feeble and silly excuses, trying to explain why they hadn't had any letters directly from Maria. He insisted that she had been writing and was perplexed as to why her letters were not reaching the family and only his were. Then later on, he claimed that Maria had injured her hand, so she was unable to write to them, but reassured them that everything was fine between them and that they were happily married. So William returned to London and quickly began a new life for himself. In fact, he placed an advertisement in the Times seeking a wife, ultimately choosing Mary Moore, a school teacher. And believe it or not, there were over a hundred responses to marry him. So him and Mary, they tied the knot in November 1827 and opened a girls school in Ealing. But after Maria's disappearance, her stepmother started having these unsettling dreams about where she might be. She was having these visions and the dream seemed to hint that Maria had been murdered and buried beneath this red barn and couldn't shake this feeling that these dreams were trying to tell her something. So she convinced her husband to search the barn. And as shocking as it was, he found a disturbed patch of earth exactly where Anne's dream had indicated. So standing there armed with his mole catching spike, he began to dig and eventually uncovered the body of his daughter. And she had been strangled with a green handkerchief, also shot in the face. Not to mention it appeared to have been stabbed in her chest and neck, although these injuries could have been caused by her father's reckless digging. But there is a theory that suggests Maria's stepmother was having an affair with William, who was closer in age and appearance than her elderly husband. And some people speculated that Anne may have been aware of what happened to Maria and was waiting for William to come back so they could run away together crazy chest type plan right but hell have no fury like a woman scorned because when she learned that william had married someone else in london she decided to seek revenge by revealing the truth about the murder oh and it is worth noting that anne's nightmares only began after william's marriage which was about a year after maria's death isn't it strange that the spirit world didn't start sending her dream sooner i mean after everyone found out, the authorities were notified and immediately began searching for William, and they quickly located him at the schoolhouse with his wife. And despite months of messaging Maria's family and lying about her well-being, William claimed that he had no knowledge of her whereabouts when questioned by the police. However, a French passport was discovered in his possession, indicating that he may have been planning to flee the country. As soon as William Corder was arrested for Maria's murder, the media went into a literal frenzy. Journalists and reporters were convinced of his guilt and wasted no time in writing scandalous articles about the crime. And even before the trial began, William was portrayed as a cold-blooded killer. The public became fascinated with this case and various forms of media, including books, songs, and plays, all depicted the gruesome details of the murder. Meanwhile, William sat in jail awaiting his trial. The infamous Red Barn where the murder took place became a popular tourist site with pottery and souvenirs being made in its honor. Some people even scavenged pieces of the wood from the barn to sell as mementos, including toothpicks made from its remains. 
And in the same way, souvenir hunters relentlessly chipped away at Maria's grave. And by the time the trial began on August 7th, 1828, William had already been found guilty in the court of public opinion. And he even brought this up to Judge Alexander, who was presiding over the case, stating, The all-powerful press, which shapes the opinions of so many individuals in this country and often unintentionally becomes a slander and destroyer of innocence, has depicted me as the most vile and repulsive of creatures. I have been portrayed by the media as a depraved monster beyond redemption. Despite William's words, this was all for a request for a change of location, but it was denied and the trial proceeded as planned. And he was facing multiple charges of murder, including stabbing, strangulation, shooting, and even live burial. However, due to the limited forensic technology in the 1800s, it was impossible to determine Maria's exact cause of death. And the court wanted to avoid any chance at all that William could be acquitted on a technicality, so they also charged him with other crimes such as fraud. And it was evident that they were determined to ensure that he faced the consequences for his actions. But did things go too far? You see, the trial was a highly anticipated event, with tickets being sold to those who wanted to witness the proceedings in person. And for those who couldn't get inside, they had to settle for waiting outside to hear the news of the day. And people from all over the country flocked to the town, causing hotels to quickly reach full capacity. Some individuals even resorted to sleeping outdoors. And according to one account, the streets were so crowded that it took officials half an hour just to make their way into the building through the throngs of the onlookers. Now, William's defense crumbled like a house of cards as he desperately tried to explain away Maria's death. But the gaping holes in his story only fueled suspicion and disgust. Why did he hide her death, lying to her family for months while she lay buried in the barn? Was this just all a twisted game or a calculated cover-up? So the evidence against him was overwhelming, but the jury's decision seemed almost predetermined by the frenzy of media coverage surrounding the case. And in just 35 minutes, they delivered a verdict. And that verdict was guilty. And Judge Alexander showed no mercy when he sentenced William to hang for his unforgivable crimes. And instead of being given a proper burial, his body was to be dissected and studied for medical purposes. And during the period leading up to his death, William was constantly harassed by court officials demanding a confession. And in the end, he admitted to causing Maria's death, but unintentionally. He said he had mistakenly shot her in the eye and then buried her in a panic. He maintained, though, that he did not stab her, although he did address the handkerchief that was found around her neck. But regardless of how she died, nothing excuses the fact that he pretended she was alive for months after her death. And three days after his conviction, William was publicly hanged with an audience of thousands. In fact, some reports even claim there was over 20,000 people watching. Now, for those of you with squeamish stomachs, this is where you might want to leave. His lifeless body just swung there for a whole hour before it was finally removed. And the executioner had carved this deep incision down his front, displaying his torso to the large crowd of onlookers. And his remains were thoroughly dissected. And his skeleton was repurposed as a tool for medical education. But the hangman saw an opportunity to profit from the macabre fascination surrounding the crime and sold pieces of the rope that were actually used in the hanging. Seeing this, others joined in and auctioned off items like locks of Maria's hair and fragments of the barn where the tragedy took place. And in some strange twist of events, William's scalp and one of his ears were obtained from the dissection and ended up being exhibited at a museum in London. But as a final gruesome act, William's skin was forcibly removed, used to bind a book that detailed his heinous crime. And this leather-bound book bore a permanent reminder of William's despicable deeds, creating an eternal connection between him and his victims. But even in death, William's spirit was not at rest. His ravaged body was put on display in the Hunterium Museum as a macabre attraction for the curious public. 
and with each passing day, it became increasingly clear that William's soul was not happy with how his remains were being treated. So Dr. John Kilner, an avid follower of the Red Barn murder, acquired William's skull through questionable means. And almost immediately, he began experiencing this string of misfortune, and also haunted by voices and plagued by visions of vengeful ghosts. And then one fateful night, as he lied in bed, a deafening noise shattered the stillness of the house. So he rushed downstairs, and Kilner found that the cabinet containing the cursed skull had been opened on its own accord, and the protective box had cracked open as well, and the skull itself had been thrown across the room. At this moment, terrified and certain that he had unleashed William's angry spirit upon himself, Kellner arranged for a proper Catholic burial for the skull in hopes of appeasing this restless soul. Yet, even after this final act of respect, strange occurrences continued to plague those who came in contact with any of William's remains. And it wasn't until 2004 when descendants of the Corridor family demanded that his body be removed from public display and cremated. And after years of fear and unease surrounding his presence, William could finally rest in peace. Or so they thought. Thank you guys so much for watching. It really means a lot. And if you enjoyed the story, please make sure to hit that like button right now. Also, make sure to subscribe right now to Strange Bar and Grill. And also, if you feel like it, subscribe to me as well. Because we want to do more and more collabs for you. So, I mean, those were the two stories. Hope you got a little enjoyment out of that. Please don't forget to show some love. That like button really means a lot. And if you want to see more stories, click here.